Hello, everybody, and thank you for that warm welcome, Hassan. I'm so thrilled to be with you here tonight to talk about something that has been my absolute favorite thing to talk about since I was younger than anyone in this room, and that's sharks. As Hassan mentioned, I live and work in the Washington, D.C. area. I am in Europe because of a once-every-four-years global scientific conference called Sharks International that just finished in Valencia, so I am about as excited about sharks than I, that I ever am right now. Uh, I am an interdisciplinary marine conservation biologist, and I want to break down a little bit about what all of that means uh, to give you a sense of some of the stuff I'll be ranting to you about this evening. A marine conservation biologist is a little different from the marine biology you may be more familiar with. It means I'm not just studying fish. It means I'm not just studying where do fish go, what do fish eat, and things like that. It means explicitly trying to answer questions about the conservation and management of endangered species. And interdisciplinary, that means I'm not just studying the animals that live in the ocean, I'm also studying the humans. What, do, what are the laws? What are the policies? What are the economics? What do people know? What do people want? What do people fear? And all that, all that means is every day is a little bit different. Some days I'm out on a boat catching and measuring and tagging sharks and taking scientific samples from them. Some days I'm walking around in the Washington, D.C. area, speaking in the halls of power, trying to bend someone's ear about changing this policy or that. It means some days, that I, and it means some days I get to dress up like an idiot and go speak in schools. So it means every day is a little bit different, and I absolutely love my job. And as Hassan mentioned, I invite you to follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, at Why Sharks Matter. Uh, I'm, if uh, you have a question that comes up later, there'll be lots of time for questions tonight, but if something comes up later, or if you want to learn more about how to get involved, social media is a great way to help with that. So as I mentioned, I've loved sharks for a really, really long time. Uh, the picture in the upper left there, I'm four years old in that photo. Uh, there, I definitely had shark toys and shark shirts and things like that before that photo, but this is the earliest one we could find. And I want to tell you a little bit tonight about why I love sharks so much and why they've held my attention for my entire life and some of the things I've learned in a career studying them and in a lifetime of being obsessed with them. And in doing so, I want to introduce you to some of the new theme or the themes of my new book, Why Sharks Matter. So I love speaking in facilities like this one. And I've been traveling all around speaking in zoos and aquariums and science museums and places like that because I grew up really far from the ocean. I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We figured out in researching this book that I was 381.2 miles from the ocean. I did live in Australia for six months and Canada for two years, and I still don't think in kilometers, sorry, but very far from the ocean. So one of the reasons why I fell in love with sharks was public science institutions, museums, libraries, zoos, and aquariums. Um, on the right side there, you're seeing me and my younger brother visiting the Pittsburgh Zoo. And those are the very first sharks I ever saw in my whole life were in the shark tank at the Pittsburgh Zoo. And on the left side there, you're seeing the first stop of my book tour. Tonight is stop number 39. <laughs> uh, the, the first stop of my book tour is at the Pittsburgh Zoo right next to the shark tank that held the very first sharks I ever saw when I was a kid. Uh, it was a real full, cir full circle moment for me. It was absolutely lovely to get to speak there. And uh, I was assured uh, repeatedly the question has come up before, so I'll just address it now. Don't worry about the caution wet floor sign next to the 500,000 gallon shark tank. They've assured me that it's been leaking for 10 years. They don't know where it's coming from, but it's probably fine. <laughs> so one of the things that I absolutely love about sharks is how weird and different they are. They are, and that starts on the inside. It starts with their skeletons. And I want to demonstrate this for you today. I want everyone to hold your arm in front of your face like this. Pick a point about halfway between your wrist and your elbow and try to bend your arm there. Hopefully you can't. <laughs> if anyone was able to, we're going to stop and call an ambulance. Now crinkle your ears. Crinkle your nose. You feel how much more flexible that is? That's bone. Our skeletons are made out of bone. Sharks aren't. 
Sharks do not have any bones in their body. Their skeleton is made out of cartilage, what our ears and nose are. That's also true of the skates, the rays, and the chimeras. Collectively, they're called the cartilaginous or cartilage-skeletoned fishes. And if you learn nothing else from your evening with a marine biologist tonight, fishes is a correct word. It's not just fish. Uh, so cart why would you want that? Well, cartilage is lighter than bone. It's more flexible than bone. Among other things, it means sharks are flexible enough that if you grab them on the tail, they can turn around and bite your hand while you're holding your tail. So if you needed another reason to not grab a shark by the tail, there's one for you. Uh, and it also heals faster than bone. So pretty cool stuff. But this is also why most of the shark fossils that you hear about are teeth. Um, the rest of their bones don't typically fossilize. Sharks also have an entire sense, an entire way of perceiving the world around them that we don't have. I don't just mean that they can see better than we can, though they can. I don't just mean that they can smell better than we can, though they can. I mean they can perceive a part of the world that we cannot perceive at all. They can sense electromagnetic fields in their environment. And let me tell you why you might want that if you're a predator. If we were going out hunting for food and our prey animal was hiding under the sand or the mud, we couldn't see it, we couldn't hear it, we couldn't smell it, we would go hungry. But not so for sharks. They can sense the electric field given off by its beating heart, even under sand or mud, and they know it's there. I think that's just so cool. Uh, the gentleman who discovered this, Ad Kalmin, is in the photograph behind me here. Uh, this is su uh, such a recent discovery, though I, I, I imagine just a, that I see a lot of uh, five to 10 year olds in the audience tonight, and I bet most of them knew this already. That's such a recent discovery that the gentleman who discovered it was alive until 2022. He passed away in January. And the, ar the article behind me, uh, I got to write for American Scientist magazine profiling his life and the legacy of his discovery, one of the more powerful things I've ever gotten to write. Uh, and if you want to learn more about this, it's in the May issue of American Scientist magazine, and it is freely available online. Sharks also are an incredibly biodiverse group. We've got some shark nerds in the room tonight. For the next 20 seconds, I want you to shout out shark species at me. Don't raise your hand, just shout them. Let's go. Great white whale shark. Mago. Greenland shark. Goblin shark. Cookie cutters. Zebra shark. All right. Whale shark, and stop, that was 11, that was pretty good. There are 536 known species of sharks, uh, and there is a new species of shark, skate, ray, or chimera discovered somewhere in the world every two weeks, and that's been true for the last 12 years. So for our younger members of the audience tonight, if you wanna be a marine biologist when you grow up, like I guarantee at least one of your parents did at one point in their childhood, there's still gonna be plenty for you to do. These animals come in just about every shape and size and color you can imagine. They have incredible biodiversity of behaviors and habitats and abilities and ecological impacts. The US Navy SEALs have a saying that if you wanna see if there are sharks in the water near you, what you do is you dip your finger in the water and you taste it. And if it's salty, that means you're in the ocean and there are sharks near you. <laughs> and that's true. If you've ever been in the ocean, there was a shark not that far from you and it knew you were there. Remember their amazing senses. Uh, but it's also incomplete because some sharks live in rivers. So just an incredibly biodiverse group. Some live under Arctic ice. Some live in the deep sea where it's so dark that sunlight never reaches. Some live in the open ocean where they'll never, they will never encounter a hard surface in their whole lives. Incre the smallest is the size of my forearm. The largest is the size of a bus. Uh, some, are, some are spotted, some are striped. One is bubblegum pink in color. So just an incredible diversity. Of, uh, of these animals. I wanna highlight for you some of my favorite weird and wonderful species here to give you a sense of just how biodiverse this group is. In the lower right, that's called the American pocket shark. And it's not called that because it's small enough to fit in your pocket, though it is blown up this size is significantly larger than the actual size of the American pocket shark. It's called that because it has these weird pockets behind its eye that you can see as a little slit there that are filled with glow-in-the-dark liquid that it can squirt on command to scare away predators. In the lower left, you see the megamouth shark. One thing that I love about megamouth sharks is how they were discovered. They were discovered in 1974 when a US Navy vessel hit one, not with the boat, with their anchor. If they had deployed that anchor chain 30 seconds sooner or 30 seconds later, it would have been 10 years before science would have learned about this amazing species, the megamouth shark. 
They live in the deep sea, and they have glow-in-the-dark gums. And that when you live in the deep sea, there's no light. So some organisms have lights, like the anglerfish, to attract mates or things like that. And sometimes it's to attract prey, to go check out, hey, what's that weird light thing, and swim right into their mouths. That is snack time goals right there. <laughs> Another thing that I love about megamouth sharks is their scientific name. Most Latin names translate to something boring, like the gray bird with the brown spot on its head or something. This is Megacosmopelagios, the giant mouth of the deep. By science standards, that's poetry. Just love them. In the center there, I actually have to update this slide after this past week of it, 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 hanging out with all these shark nerds in Valencia. That is one of my favorite weird and wonderful species. And this last week at the, at the Oceanographic in Valencia, Europe's largest aquarium, I got to see one alive. I never thought I would get to do that in my entire career, and I fell to my knees in the aquarium. Someone actually came over to make sure I was okay. But that is an, ang that is an angular rough shark. You often think of shark species as being fast and powerful and sleek and athletic, something like the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, shortfin mako shark, especially North Atlantic populations that are not far from the west coast of the UK. It's the fastest fish in the ocean. They can swim up to 46 miles an hour, uh, which is, again, I'm sorry, I don't think in kilometers yet. I meant to update these, but that is that's not as fast as you drive on the highway, but it's faster than you drive in your neighborhood. Angular rough shark is not sleek or powerful or athletic. It is the exact opposite of that. They are the couch potatoes of the ocean. And for the last two years, I've been relating to that more and more, as I know many of you have as well. But they had two of them just in a regular tank at the aquarium. It was so cool. And I, I, I was not sure if I was overly freaking out, but then a bunch of my much more senior, much more experienced colleagues had a similar freak out at this tank. I'm like, all right, this is genuinely cool. In the right side, uh, right column center, you see a basking shark. There are basking sharks found in UK waters. Uh, they are currently, for me, that's the species that got away. Uh, after a conference in Glasgow a few years ago, I organized a, a busload of marine biologists to go out to the Hebrides and go out with Basking Sharks Scotland and spend the day swimming with basking sharks. And they took us out so far and they spent all day with us and we didn't see a single basking shark. The next day, I'm a little bummed, we still had a great day on the water, we got to swim with seals, it was fun. And the next day, Shane from Basking Shark Scotland is texting me as I'm sitting in Glasgow airport that they found 30 of them. <laughs> this is the second largest fish in the ocean, it can get the size of a, a school bus as well, uh, and I missed them by a day. My, my, uh, my interns used to say that they would, they would fight to see who got to go out on the boat the day after me, because it's, uh, I'm often good luck for whoever comes next. <laughs> You do have lots of sharks right here at home. When I lived in Canada, I was always surprised by how many of my friends and neighbors uh, were surprised to learn that there were sharks in Canada, including several PhD biologists that said, what do you mean you're studying Canadian sharks? We don't have any sharks in Canada. Yes, they do. You have sharks here as well. The graphic on the top here is from the Guardian, which is species that are starting to come into UK waters uh, due to climate change and uh, sea surface temperature rise. Um, on the left side, you have a, a group called the Shark Trust, which many of you may be familiar with, uh, that's produced a guide to shark skates and rays of UK waters. They do a lot of work with mako sharks. They do a lot of work with angel sharks. They do a lot of work uh, with blue sharks, which are one of the most heavily fished species. Um, and there was headlines last year about uh, sh sharks and, and seahorses found right here, in the, right here in the rivers. So plenty of sharks right here at home. Sharks also have absolutely amazing behaviors. In the lower right, what you're seeing is a goblin shark, which some folks over here were shouting very excitedly about. I agree, goblin sharks are awesome. Lots of animals can hyperextend their jaws in front of their face. Snakes famously do this. But one, one of the fastest in the animal kingdom is the goblin shark. That video has slowed down 100 times, so you can see what's happening here. In the raw video, you can't see anything, just suddenly the fish is not there. In the upper right, that video is not slowed down. That is the cruising speed of the adult Greenland shark, the slowest moving large animal in the ocean. But they are in no particular hurry because they can live to be 400 years old. They are the longest lived vertebrate animal on land or sea. And they eat polar bears. I love Greenland sharks. In the lower left, 
you're seeing a hammerhead. People often ask me, hey, what are the, isn't that head weird? What do they use that for? There's a few things. One of them is it's extra surface area for that electromagnetic sense. You often see hammerheads swooping their head over the sand, uh, much like you might see someone at the beach with a metal detector, basically doing the same thing, looking for prey. And also, as you see here, they use it to pin down flat prey, in this case a stingray, that they can then munch on without it being able to get away. I once saw the skull of a hammerhead that had 71 stingray barbs embedded in it. Um, so the stingrays are not doing a great job at deterring the hammerheads. In the upper left there, you're seeing a thresher shark, which do occasionally come into North Atlantic waters. Their tail is as long as the rest of their body combined, and until 2013, we had no idea what the heck they used that for, though it does seem to get tangled in fishing gear a lot. And then a scuba diver in Indonesia filmed that. It arches its back and whips the tail, and it makes a shockwave underwater that stuns fish that it can go munch on. Just wild. And on the left side here, you're seeing a kite fin shark. This is the largest of the sharks that, whose whole bodies can glow in the dark, but there are a whole lot of sharks whose whole bodies can glow in the dark. There's a whole family called the lantern sharks, and my favorite lantern shark is called the ninja lantern shark. It is called that because my friend and colleague Vicky Vasquez, who discovered it, discovered it right around US Thanksgiving and was home with her family and everyone was talking about what's new at school, what's new at work. And she said, I discovered a new species of shark and I get to name it whatever I want. And one of her young cousins runs into the room and says, ninjas are cool, call it the ninja shark. So she did, and the ninja lantern shark came to be. This is, I think, the most wholesome story in the entire history of marine biology. Where baby sharks come from, and I apologize, it's just not possible to come to a talk about sharks and not hear at least one baby shark joke anymore. I don't make the rules. Uh, but where baby sharks come from is also incredibly diverse. Some sharks give live birth just like mammals. That's what you're seeing up top there is a lemon shark being born in Florida. And as soon as it's born, it just has to be a miniature shark and take care of itself. Sharks don't have any parental care of any kind. Some shark species lay eggs. You may have heard of mermaids' purses washing up on beaches. Those are often skate eggs, but there are some shark species that have egg cases as well. You're seeing there an egg case at an aquarium with the top removed so you can see what's happening inside. Some sharks have a weird mix of this that's only found in sharks, where the animals hat grow up within eggs and then the eggs hatch inside the mom and then they, the last few weeks they develop inside the mom and then are born as if live birth. When I started writing my book, there were eight known forms of reproduction, there are now 10. So there's new stuff discovered all the time with this. Some of the crazier ones that I love, some sharks can clone themselves. A female shark can be, decide that she wants to reproduce, sometimes it's because she thinks she's nearing the end of her life, sometimes she just has a lot of resources, um, and there's not a suitable daddy shark around. So, so she just becomes pregnant, and instead of the babies being a mix of the DNA of mom and dad, they're just clones of mom. Some sharks can mate and then say, you know what, now is not really a great time for me to be pregnant, but I went through all the trouble of mating. Shark mating is extraordinarily violent. Uh, extraordinarily violent. Uh, but I went through all the trouble of mating, but I don't want to be pregnant now. So the females can store sperm inside their body and then later become pregnant at a time of their choosing. The record for that is just under four years. Some sharks have what's called multiple paternity, and that is when a female shark will, will mate with multiple males, become pregnant by several of them simultaneously, and give birth to a litter of half-siblings with the same mom but different dads born at the same time. So just an incredible biodiversity here. When most people think about sharks, they don't think about all that awesome stuff that I was just talking about. The, probably those of you who come out on a rainy Monday night to hear a science nerd lecture, you might not be a typical case, case here. When most people think about sharks, you think about sharks as a threat to you and your family. And where my parents live in Florida, this is on the news all the time. Uh, even here in the UK, you're starting to get stories about so will climate change bring great whites into our waters and are the beaches safe and things like that. And a big part of the reason for this is a movie called Jaws. So for those of you who came in early, you heard the Jaws theme playing in the theater uh, as, as you walked in. Before this movie came out, and this for the, the older folks in the audience, the movie just celebrated its 47th anniversary of theatrical release. Uh, so time comes for us all. Uh, before Jaws came out, most people didn't really think about sharks very much. Surfers did, fishermen did, but most people who went to the beach just didn't really think about what lay just beyond the, the water's edge. 
And this movie changed the world, and not in a good way. Uh, we actually have something in the public policy literature called the Jaws Effect, which describes how a fictional portrayal of a real-world issue affects how actual people actually think about that problem. Um, and another example of this, the one with less, re less uh, potentially conservation-relevant implications of how a movie just breaks people's brains about what things are, is Jurassic Park. If I ask you to think of a T-Rex, you think of the Tyrannosaurus Rex from Jurassic Park, even though we know that's not what they look like or how they behaved. So Spielberg has a lot to answer for here. But the author of Jaws, Peter Benchley, was so horrified by how people reacted to what he thought was just a fun summer movie that he spent most of the rest of his life raising funds and awareness for shark conservation. And that ninja lantern shark that I mentioned earlier, to honor this, its scientific name is Benchley Eye. So I don't want to minimize that there are every once in a while people who get hurt by sharks. Every once in a while there's even someone who is killed by a shark. Uh, this, I don't want to minimize these very real tragedies, but just to give you a sense of the relative risk here, uh, which should always be factored in when factoring in any, any kind of policy response, here are some things that kill more people than sharks in a typical year. More people are bitten by other people on the New York City subway every year <laughs> than are bitten by sharks. And I can always tell who's been to New York City by how you react to that statement. Because some people are like, that doesn't make any sense. And some people go, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Flower pots falling on your head from above when you walk down the street kill more people than sharks do. As a social media guy, I love this one. More people fall off cliffs and die while trying to take selfies of the beautiful scenery behind them than are killed by sharks. If we're gonna do a selfie right now, I want everyone to give me the shark sign. I will put this on my Instagram tomorrow. Ah, I bet Faraday never did that from this stage. <laughs> and this one, that's a vending machine. I got a very, very weirdly hostile phone call a few weeks ago. Uh, that this statistic that vending machines kill more people than sharks was included in my book because apparently that has not been true since 2009 under the Obama administration our occupational health and safety administration put in new rules about vending machine safety and this person was very upset that I didn't know this uh, so now I leave this slide in here out of spite but it was true until 2009 <laughs> that vending machines killed more people in the United States than sharks do uh, though, for the record, I do not know anyone who has been seriously injured by a shark, and I do know two people who have been seriously injured by vending machines. <laughs> people shake them, and they fall on you. You punch them, the glass breaks. It's a whole thing. These things are death traps. So not only are sharks not bad, but they're actively good. Sharks help keep the food web in balance. The ecosystem services that they provide help keep the ocean healthy. And when we're talking about the ocean and coastal food webs, these are, these are ecosystems that billions with a B of humans depend on for food security. And tens of millions of humans depend on for, uh, for employment, for jobs, for livelihoods. We want our oceans to be healthy, and that means keeping the food chain healthy, and that means keeping the top of the food chain healthy. Don't worry about trying to interpret that diagram, but what I want you to see on the diagram on the left here is there's a bunch of boxes with words on them. Don't worry if you can't see the words. Each of those is a bird or fish or marine mammal or uh, invertebrate or plankton that lives off the coast of Cape Cod in the Northwest Atlantic Ocean. And the arrows are ecological interactions between them. This eats this, this competes with this for space, et cetera, et cetera. This is my favorite food web diagram, and you know you're a normal person when you have a favorite food web diagram. And the reason why I love this is so much is because this is called a simplified food web of the Northwest Atlantic. This is simplified. It's more confusing than that. If I were to pluck one thread out of that web, the whole thing probably wouldn't unravel, right? If I were to pluck five, I'd start to get pretty nervous. And more than that, I'd start to get very, very nervous. We do not want to be pulling threads out of this web. And there's something in ecology called top-down control, which basically means that a predator eating prey has an especially strong ecological effect. So downward-facing arrows are especially powerful here. Without top predators, the entire food web can unravel. I also want to bring your attention to this diagram on the right here. So what you see is the base is sort of dark green, and then there's a bunch of blue-black dots, and surrounding some of those blue black dots are white circles. Everyone with me so far? Let me tell you what you're looking at here. This is a satellite photo of a coral reef. Um, and there's this, the, the brown stuff on the ground is a seagrass meadow. 
The individual black dots are coral bombies, coral heads, individual units of a coral reef. And the white is sand where the seagrass has been picked clean. Little fish that live in those coral bombies, what you're seeing is how far they're willing to venture out before they start to get afraid and go back. So you get this, these perfect little white circles surrounding shelter. This is something called fear ecology, the ecology of fear. I think it's one of the most fascinating things happening in uh, large animal ecology today, and it basically says that the mere presence, or even possible presence, of a predator changes prey to cha causes prey to change their behavior in ways that could have entire ecosystem-wide impacts like you see here. Uh, this, is, this paper title is another example of what I call scientific poetry. This paper is called A Halo of Fear Visible from Space. If you've ever read other scientific paper titles, you know why I like that one so much. Um, I performed a survey of all of the environmental nonprofit groups that work on shark issues in the, in the English-speaking world, and they found this idea, this top bar on the left, uh, I, I asked them, when you tell people we need to conserve sharks, what reasons do you give for why we should conserve sharks? And this idea that sharks are important to a healthy ecosystem and without sharks, bad things happen to the ecosystem, the number one reason by far more than all the other reasons combined. Uh, so this is why I, my social media branding, the book, all this has been why sharks matter. It's not just why sharks are cool, it's why your life is better with healthy shark populations off our coasts. And your life is better with healthy shark populations of our coast. The risk of having sharks is very small in terms of public safety, and the benefit in terms of ecosystem services is massive. Unfortunately, I have some bad news now. Many species of sharks face very, very, very serious conservation challenges. In fact, the problem is so bad and has gotten worse so fast that this beautiful infographic from 2015 is already out of date. It's already worse than this. In the upper right there, it says that the IUCN red list estimates that a quarter of all known species of sharks, skates, rays, and chimeras are considered threatened with extinction. It's now closer to a third, and that's since 2015. We've had those, those reactions. The number one threat, by far, so much that there's functionally not a number two threat, is humans. It's us. We are killing sharks through unsustainable fishing practices, overfishing, uh, as well as things like bycatch, which is when you're, at, you're accidentally trying to catch a tuna and you accidentally catch, or, and you, or you're trying to catch a tuna and you accidentally catch sea turtles or seabirds or marine mammals or sharks that are swimming near the tuna. Uh, this is a major threat for sharks. This includes markets for shark fins, which many of you may have heard of. I'm not going to go into much detail about that, about that issue uh, because we have some young ears in the audience tonight and it's somewhat graphic. Um, it also includes shark meat, which many people have not heard of. Which is, a, which is an issue in of itself that, you, that folks have not heard of this. It includes intentionally catching sharks. It includes accidentally catching sharks. So the shark, shark fin soup, some of you may have heard of. It's a traditional Southeast Asian um, Chinese delicacy, also consumed by the diaspora communities around the world. In the 1990s, this was sort of the boogeyman of the ocean conservation world. This is the worst thing. We need to focus on this. Uh, it is much, 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 much less of a problem than it used to be. And you might be thinking, this is the only threat to sharks I've ever heard of, so that must be great news. Sharks must be doing great. But wait, no, I just told you things have gotten worse since 2015. So what's happened? Meat. The rise of the shark meat trade. Uh, this, so more sharks are being killed now, and it notably goes to different markets. The, the quantity of shark meat being traded internationally has exploded over the last 10 years. Uh, the United Kingdom is the number 11, uh, country in terms of shark meat export exporting and the number nine in terms of imports. So if you thought that this was a far away issue, it is not. Uh, notably, I've also had some interactions with members of the ocean conservation community where they've told me that this, this bowl behind me, a bowl of shark fin soup, that's evil, that's vile, that's repulsive, that's repugnant. But that, a grilled mako shark steak, that's fine because that's how normal people eat fish other than the fact that that makes no sense at all from a conservation perspective, either way the fish is dead, that's also super racist, as I hope is clear to everyone here, so that we have issues with that in the, the conservation community. Uh, oh, we're the 20, Britain is the 20th largest shark fishing nation by total landings, and uh, the 10th largest exporter of shark meat. You may have heard um, that lots of your chippies, the fish and chip stores, sell uh, fried spiny dogfish. Uh, if you ever go to a chippy and they say, oh, the, the fish of the day is rock salmon. No, it's not. 
There ain't no such thing as a rock salmon. I will note here that sustainably caught fishes are absolutely a thing that really does exist. Sustainably caught sharks, absolutely a thing that does exist. But maybe we shouldn't be eating critically endangered species and telling people it's something else. Just a thought. <laughs> you can be forgiven if you've never heard of the shark meat trade. One of the, one of the studies that I did in my interdisciplinary conservation biology was I had a team of students that read every newspaper article that, that over the last 10 years from the whole English-speaking world that covered broadly defined shark conservation. And we found that shark finning and the shark fin trade was mentioned but almost seven times as often as the shark meat trade. That's not good because one of those threats is declining and one of those threats is rising and it, the one that's rising is not the one that got more coverage. The good news is all is not lost. We know how to help these animals. By we, I mean the scientific and conservation and management communities. We know what tools work. We know what help is needed. We know when certain tools don't work. We know what we need to make certain tools work better. We know when we need your help to make things work. And that's a big part of the reason why I wanted to write my new book, because I've done a lot of these sorts of lectures uh, even before I wrote the book. What we academics call public science engagement and what you probably call talking to people. I've done a lot of this and I often find that after my talks, people would come up to me and say, that was really interesting. I thought I knew a lot about Goshen conservation, but I've never heard of this before. Can you recommend something for me to read that I don't need to have a PhD to understand? And until this year, I've had to say, not really, sorry. So I wanted to make the world of shark conservation and management policy accessible to you, the people. I want to briefly introduce, I know you didn't come here for a law school lecture tonight, but a brief introduction here will hopefully be illustrative. The number one threat facing sharks is unsustainable overfishing. And there's two main philosophies, two main schools of thoughts on how we fix that. One is, unsustainable overfishing is bad. Let's make it more sustainable. These are things like size limits, if it's too small, you throw it back. Quotas, you can only catch this much in a year. If you've ever done any fishing of any kind, you're familiar with these sorts of tools. Uh, and there's also a newer school of thought that says, no, we need to ban all fishing entirely. We need to ban all consumption of shark products entirely, all trade of shark products, ent products entirely. And these are the limit-based tools. These are things like shark sanctuaries, which you may have heard of, and bans on the sale of shark fin. This is not a new debate. Uh, there in, 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 this is a book that many of you who have ever taken an environmental, an environmental Science 101 course may have read excerpts of this. This is uh, John Muir and Gifford Pinchot, the founder of the US Forest Service and the US National Park Service. This is the debate between preservation versus conservation. Or it's the goal of protecting nature so we have stuff we can use, or is it for nature and keep it pristine? Um, and this, this is uh, something that makes the shark, uh, public understanding of shark issues such a fascinating area to work for me. Most Westerners would probably agree that anchovies are a natural resource to be sustainably exploited, but the great whales, no, those are wildlife. That's wilderness, we need to preserve it. And sharks sort of fall awkwardly in the middle here, with some people feeling very strongly that they're one way, and some people feeling very strongly that they're another way, and that leads to a lot of really, really interesting discussions, and sometimes it makes my social media mentions kind of a mess for a day or two. But for the record, I also surveyed all the shark scientists in the world, and found that 90% think that the goal of shark conservation should be making fisheries more sustainable, not banning shark fishing, not banning the trade in shark products. And if you consider yourself pretty broadly knowledgeable about ocean conservation and you've never heard that before, something that's supported by 90% of experts, I would encourage you to rethink where you're getting your information from. And finally, the last theme of my book, and something that any of you who already follow me on social media have seen me rant about many, 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 many times, is that more people than ever are trying to help sharks and want to help sharks, and that's great. But wanting to help and trying to help are not the same thing as actually helping. It matters what you do. And there's a lot of stuff that people do that not only doesn't help, but can make the problem worse. There are lots of people who are really well-intentioned, but not especially well-informed. They genuinely, sincerely, in their heart of hearts, they want to help, they want to do the right thing, but they don't have years and years of education in this, and they don't have experience. So what do they do? They Google it, and some of the first hits are written by people who have no idea what they're talking about. Some of the first hits are written by extremist organizations who have no idea what they're talking about. Um, and this leads to people 
what we call suboptimal policy outcomes is the technical term for this. I might also call it a hot mess. There are also unscrupulous people who exploit the well-intentioned but uninformed. That they might say, you can't trust the scientists, you can't trust the mainstream or environmental community, give me your money and I'll save the ocean. And this is a, a growing problem. Here are some amusing examples of this. Wanting to help is not the same thing as actually helping. Um, this, the gentleman on the left here uh, does things like this all the time. He, he goes swimming with sharks and he grabs them. Uh, there are people who hug sharks. There are people who ride sharks. There are people who kiss sharks. They kiss sharks. They take the bitey end of a shark and they put it on their face. I hope I don't have to tell you why that's not a good idea. <laughs> While I'm at it, don't run with scissors and look both ways before you cross the street, things you should have learned when you were two. And when confronted about this, these people will inevitably say, oh no, I'm helping, I'm doing science, I'm doing conservation, I'm doing education. I don't know what the hell is happening in that photo, but it is not conservation, it is not science, it is not education. On the right, you see one of these goofy change.org petitions. If any of you are active on Facebook and have activist friends, you probably see these things. Change.org bills itself as anyone can change the world, anyone can make a petition that can get many, many people to sign. But functionally, what anyone can make a petition means is a lot of people who don't have any idea what they're talking about make petitions, and scarier sounding petitions are spread farther. Uh, this petition was from April of this year. 60,000, 60,000 people signed it, and it is, to, it is to ban the practice of shark finning in Florida. Not one of those 60,000 people was apparently aware that we banned shark finning in Florida in 1993. <laughs> this, which means this is a petition that cannot possibly do a darn thing to help anyone or anything. All it does is confuse people about what the problems are and what the solutions to those problems are, uh, while taking time and resources away from groups that really do help polluting the airwaves. It also got change.org 60,000 email addresses, which is why their entire business model. As a social media guy, I'm obligated to remind people whenever I have a group in front of me, if you're not paying for an online service, that means you're not the customer, you're the product. So why write another shark book? I've introduced you some of the themes here tonight, but there are lots of shark books that are out there. I have three shelves of them at home, and I don't have even close to all of them. I'm working on getting all of them. There's never been one like this before. A lot of shark books are collections of fun facts about sharks, and then at the end it says, sharks are in trouble and need your help, don't eat shark fin soup. Most of you are probably not already not eating shark fin soup. So this is not an especially actionable conservation item. There's never been a book before that has tried to summarize all of the science that, uh, that's needed to understand these amazing animals and the role they play in the ecosystem. There's never been a book before that's tried to explain all the different tools and policies and laws that are used to help. There's never been a book before that's taught you how to find a great group to help that matches your personal philosophy and how to learn more about them. Explained for a general audience. And I have been uh, absolutely thrilled with the reception that I've gotten so far. I mentioned earlier tonight that this is top number 39 on my book tour and country number four. Um, so I'm, I'm having an absolute blast with this. Um, I, uh, I wrote this book for me, and that other people are interested in it sort of never really processed my, crossed my mind while I was working on it, and it's been quite rewarding. I was a starred review in the New York Times. I finally got featured on our National Public Radio Science Friday, uh, which was really awesome, and apparently I broke the New York City Public Radio work slack uh, when I said that thing about uh, Greenland sharks eating polar bears. Everyone in the office just went crazy and I crashed their work slack. Uh, I passed Jane Goodall on the Amazon science bestseller list. So it has been ab absolutely the, uh, the ride of a lifetime. Uh, and I'm, I'm having so much fun with this. Um, and I just wanna note that if anyone here or anyone watching the recording later is interested in arranging another talk and I can come to you or I can, do, I can Zoom anywhere, um, let's chat, uh, my why sharks matter at Gmail, easy to find. I'm happy to zoom into schools or libraries, never a charge for public schools or libraries. Um, so, and, I'm, and if I can't help you, I'm happy to put you in touch with another scientist who can help. So before, um, before I wrap up here and get to your questions, uh, I have a few folks to thank. 
I want to thank the Royal Institution team. This is an absolutely amazing, humbling, wonderful stage to get to speak on. And I want to thank Hassan and Lisa and Suze for helping to set this up. I want to thank my family for always supporting my crazy career goals. When I was four, I told my dad I want to be a marine biologist, and he said, I have no idea what that is, but we support you, and he really meant it. <laughs> and now, now he's retired, and he brings his golf buddies on shark research trips, so I feel like I've made it in his eyes. Uh, I want to thank my publisher, Johns Hopkins University Press, um, and our UK, or our, our UK distributor, Wiley, uh, for really giving me a lot of freedom to run with a very, very different kind of shark book. And uh, they, they trusted me, and I, I, I think it's paid off. I want to thank friends and family and colleagues for years of listening to my, me rant about why the shark books on the market weren't good enough and my vision for a new book. Uh, and I want to extend a deep and sincere thanks to you. I'm currently having the time of my life traveling around the world talking about my favorite thing to talk about, and I couldn't do it if no one wanted to listen. Uh, so before I wrap up and take your questions, I just want to tell a quick funny story about this picture. I was a sponsor of the 2019 Sigma Xi Conference, which is basically a, a US nationwide science fair for uh, middle, middle grade and high school students. And I had this Ask Me Anything You Want About Sharks booth. And we opened it up to the public too. So the residents of Madison, Wisconsin were coming in all weekend and asking questions about sharks, all these genius kids who were taking a break from their science fair projects were coming in to ask about sharks. It was awesome. At one point, I get up to go to the bathroom, and I come back, and there is a 10-year-old boy sitting in that chair answering people's questions about sharks. <laughs> and I, I sat and watched him for about 15 minutes, and he got most of the questions right. It was fun. Uh, so thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, I am happy to answer any questions that you have about marine biology, about sharks, about ocean conservation, about me or the book. Anything that you want to know, uh, I, am, I am at your disposal. And again, we, we'll, right, at, right after the q and I'm going to move right out there and do some, some book signings. So thank you for having me. Hi. Hi, testing. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, in addition to rock salmon, are there any, any other like euphemisms that we should be on the lookout for? Oh, there's so that many thing, weird euphemisms for fish. Uh, I mean, how many of you have heard of an orange roughy? Yeah? that we used to call those slime heads. Uh, so that was a pretty good uh, marketing name, because who wants to go to a fancy restaurant and order a slime head, but Orange Ruffy, like, you'd be pretty excited to see it at a nice restaurant for 35 pounds or something. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of marketing going on there. That's, the rock salmon's one of the few that I would consider actively misleading. Uh, sometimes it's just start trying to make it sound more appealing. Uh, around here, rock salmon is the, is the big one. Great question, thank you. Hi there. I just want to ask how new uh, sources of uh, information, and here I'm particularly thinking about uh, YouTubers and drones and uh, GoPros that are suddenly out in over above around the ocean, um, are influencing both understanding of sharks and of conservation of sharks. Great question. So. Drones have had sort of a mixed effect on that stuff. It has allowed us to film incredible behaviors and migrations and things like that that have never been seen before. Some of you may have seen recently, uh, there was vo drone footage of an orca whale taking out a great white shark off South Africa. That like no one, if, if a boat was near there, that wouldn't have happened. So the drone was able to film that. And that's absolutely incredible, mind blowing, turning, over, turning upside down our understanding of the natural world. Uh, but. Another issue with everyone having a drone, everyone having a GoPro, everyone having a smartphone, it means you all have a camera with you all the time. So when you go to the beach and you see a shark feeding in the shallows and you film it, that's now headline news everywhere in the world. Why are the sharks invading the shallows? They were there before, you just didn't have a fancy camera. And if you called the news and said they, you saw a shark by the beach, they would say, oh, okay. <laughs> a thing that drives me nuts with this is, the headlines that stress really close to the shore. The shark is really close to the shore. That's the water. Really close to the shore is the water. If you see a shark walking, down, walking around Piccadilly Circus, give me a call. But if you see a shark in the water, maybe that's not something you need to alert the news about. But yeah, there's been all sorts of really cool discoveries made with drones. Thank you. We're sort of led to believe that great whites are quite solitary animals. Um, but I, I can't remember if I read it or saw a video about it, um, that full-blooded siblings of different ages have been found in great whites. Yeah. Is that true? 
Yes, so there's at least one case that I know of where brothers, um, two male sharks from the same litter, same parents, were found hunting together when they were well into their teens. Um, and that was uh, surprising news, for sure. You often think about, and it, it's not just their, uh, their relatively aggressive um, nature, it's just that an animal that big needs a huge hunting area in order to have enough food. So they, they often um, are quite, quite well spread out. But once you get somewhere where there's a ton of food, like a seal rookery uh, or the uh, sardine run off South Africa where there's so much, so much um, biomass of food in the water, then you'll find lots of animals together just for feeding. But yeah, normally great whites are relatively solitary animals, but every once in a while you hear a crazy story about brothers that hunt together year after year in the same spot. I think that was New Zealand, but I'm not sure. Sorry, no, this was um, specifically siblings of different ages. Oh, of different ages. So, like, different oh, litters, weird. but full-blooded siblings. Oh, I don't, I don't know if I saw that, but it wouldn't surprise me. There's weird stuff like that being discovered all the time. If I, if I can track it down, I'll yeah. send it to you. <laughs> yes, I'd be very curious to see that. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions, actually. <laughs> all right. right. Um, how much of an issue do you think the sport fishing or trophy, sort of the competitions are? And That's a great question. Are there any policies that might affect change anytime soon in the pipeline? And also, um, how do you tell the difference between, with squalene, mm -hmm. plant-based or shark-based? Yes, so two, uh, two very different questions, and I will get to them both, but I'll do them, in, or do, do them in order here. So recreational angling, fishing for fun, as opposed to for your job or to provide food to the marketplace. People used to think that it was not a very big deal that you see these videos of a, a longline fisherman that can catch thousands of sharks in a day or things like that. So how much, how much of a big deal can it be for one person to go out fishing on the beach? Well, the issue is that there's more than one person doing that. So the scale of recreational fishing is what makes it potentially an issue. And I, that was a lot of what my PhD work was focused on. And we were able to get the state of Florida to change their laws <laughs> concerning uh, recreational fishing for endangered hammerhead sharks. Um, that was really cool. I tell that I tell that story in some detail in the book, uh, but people used to think that it was not it was so much so little of an issue that it's not even really worth looking at. And I said, well, maybe it's enough of an issue that one grad student should look at it for one semester and see what shakes out. And I have never it. it, it let me tell you, it doesn't happen often to have very senior people in your field come up to you and say, "I apologize, you were right and I was wrong," but it feels great. Uh, the, other, the other issue uh, was about squalene, which is a, a product made from shark liver oil. Um, sharks have huge livers. They don't have swim bladders uh, like the bony fishes do. Uh, so the way that they stay buoyant is they have giant livers, like giant. And they're full of this very light, lighter than water oil, and that can be harvested, and it's used in some uh, cosmetic products. It's used in one of the COVID vaccines, not one of the ones in the US. It might be one of the ones that's available here. I know the, the Sinovax one um, that, that's used in China, I think, has some squalene in it. Uh, but that you can get squalene from the liver oil or of a shark, but you can also make it artificially with plants. Uh, and it's, it's not that much more expensive to do it that way, but it takes longer. So typically, Anytime there's something that's more environmentally friendly, uh, that means they're doing it a slightly harder way, slightly more expensive way, and they want to be able to charge you more money for it. So they'll say, we did this the better way that you've heard of. Um, this is, this is uh, extra animal cruelty-free shampoo, or this is squalene-free whatever. So if it doesn't say uh, plant-derived, then it's probably not, is the short answer. Thank you, great question. I was sort of interested. I've just got back from South Africa myself, Wonderful. and there's uh, there's obviously been two fatalities yes. in uh, four weeks. I think it was. I'm intrigued to what you think the correct policy response should be for something like that, because it happens in an area that is quite deprived and has um, generates a large portion of its revenue from tourism, which is, I know from colleagues at work, they're busy cancelling their holidays. Um, so, what is the correct thing to do from your point of view um, in a situation like that? Yeah, uh, so there's not much you can do that actually does anything, and politicians know that, but they want to be seen as doing something. So you often get these calls to call 
local sharks to make the beaches safer or whatever. Uh, but that doesn't work because these animals are so highly migratory that even if you do kill all the great whites that are off this 100-mile stretch of coastline in South Africa, tomorrow there'll be new great white sharks. So it doesn't work unless you kill all of them, which is neither practical nor a good idea. So uh, the, one of the most effective things that reduces shark bites is tourist education. Don't go swimming by yourself in the early morning or late night near a river mouth. And if more people did that, we'd have probably half the bites that we have now. Uh, every once in a while, accidents happen. Every once in a while, tragedies happen. But there's not much that can be done about it. Um, so a, a, a quick note, because I, I just can't resist, and I, will, I know we'll get letters about this later, but it's worth it, I promise. So the, the, I assume most of you have probably seen Jaws. The mayor in Jaws, who famously does not wish to close the beaches, uh, because it's, a, for Christ's sake, it's the 4th of July, it's the biggest holiday season uh, in, in, at, at this fictional tourist town, uh, he's written to be a, a one-dimensional, obviously bad guy character, and uh, one of your recent former prime ministers said that he was that uh, this was his political hero, and that came up when discussing the COVID reg regulations. I want to be I want to be like my hero, the mayor from Jaws, who was written to be a one-dimensional bad guy character. It's very hard for me to keep up who, with who your prime minister is these days, <laughs> uh, but uh, it was either two or three ago. <laughs> For the generation who watched Jaws, yes. how do people get over their phobias of sharks? How do you get over your phobia of sharks? That's a great question. And if you ever get the opportunity to go scuba diving or snorkeling, uh, I've been assured that there is beautiful scuba diving where I'm going next week in Cornwall. Uh, no, thank you. It's too cold here for me. Uh, but I've been assured the waters are beautiful there. But you can also go on holiday somewhere where it's warm. If you ever get the chance to go snorkeling or scuba diving, seeing an animal like that and how beautiful and sleek and powerful it is and how it is just not interested in you at all, there's, you could go to 100 lectures like this one and it would not have the same effect as two minutes in the water with one. Um, in terms of like things like Discovery Shark Week, <laughs> yeah, it was something that I loved as a kid because it was you know on the TV and it was great. But I've read quite a lot about how, firstly, a lot of their documentaries are inaccurate and also they sensationalize just the killing that sharks do. And I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that, because I thought it's a great opportunity to educate people, but they're not doing it in necessarily the right way. I just wanted to know your thoughts. <laughs> yeah. How much time do we have for me to rant about Shark Week? <laughs> if you Google me, some of the top hits that come up call me Shark Week's biggest critic. Uh, I don't know if that's true, but I'm certainly not on their Christmas card list. Uh, Shark Week is the largest stage that my field gets. It's thought, science, I am currently, this is stop number 39. Look around at this audience. I've done 39 of these in the last few months. That is 1% of the audience of the lowest watched Shark Week show. It's an unbelievably huge platform and they fill it with just a dumpster fire of nonsense. And it's not, it's not even just completely fictional stuff. They've given up doing that uh, very recently, <laughs> but it's that they, you know, well, we just did what's called a content and discourse analysis of Shark Week, which is, that means we watched all of it, and by we, I mean two poor undergraduate volunteers, <laughs> watched all of Shark Week ever and wrote down what's in each episode. Where do they go? Who's in it? What, are, what species do they see? What are they doing? What do they find? What do they say about the sharks? Out of 281 episodes of Shark Week, each one which attracts an audience of, of millions, six mentioned a specific thing that viewers could do to help sharks, and three of those things were don't eat shark fin soup, which their audience is already not doing. But good, the good news is we have room for not one, but two different specials with the guys from Jackass jumping, going down a water slide and getting launched into a pile of sharks. Uh, so D Shark Week is not my favorite, no. <laughs> We'll go to the gentleman okay. in the top gun tuck. Yeah. Yes, uh, good evening. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I saw Jaws when I was 12 years old, unfortunately. That's uh, too I young. Think it, <laughs> it slipped through the censor's net. They gave it a PG, but even the parents and guardians were scared. So, um, <laughs> To answer the lady's point over there about what do you do to get over that, uh, I became a scuba diving instructor for 20 years in the Red Sea. I'd done thousands of dives and swam with hundreds of sharks. And mm -hmm. uh, they never bothered me. Um, until we had that incident in 2010, the shark attacks the of Sharm el-Sheikh. Yeah. I don't know 
if you're able to comment on that, had an involvement or anything else, but uh, it's never changed my opinion. I, I believe you actually have to try and get bitten or attacked, or that there's something else is going on, otherwise it wouldn't have worked for all those decades. Yeah. So again, if you've been in the water, there was probably a shark not that far from you, and it knew you were there, and it didn't bother you, even if you didn't see it. But those particular incidents in Egypt um, in 2010, over, uh, they're, they're sort of aberrant. Uh, they're, they're very, very, most shark bites follow a very typical pattern, um, and that, those ones didn't, and that made people very concerned. Uh, among other things, it's the only documented case ever where a single shark bit more than one human, a single individual shark. And that, like, normally we say, like, they bite a human and they realize we're not what they thought they were, and then they, they go away and we'll probably never bother a human again. And this one did a couple of days later. Uh, and that's weird. So what, what went on with that? I don't know, but you're not wrong that it was eyebrow raising. Uh, thank you so much, David. I had a question about uh, shark tourism. Mm -hmm. I was particularly thinking of the example of um, Oslob in the Philippines, mm -hmm. where uh, fishermen there are now feeding whale sharks to encourage them to come so tourists can swim with them instead of what they would previously have done, which I believe is, is catch them um, yeah. and, and sell well, the meat. Um, so I want to know what your thoughts were, and I suppose whether that's it could be an acceptable form of conservation, although it's said to be changing the behaviour of the whale sharks and you know it's influencing them not to follow some of their more migratory patterns. Yeah, so wildlife tourism is a tricky issue in general, um, and that's uh, it can be done very responsibly. There are a lot of operators that do a really great job. It's safe for the humans. It doesn't bother the sharks. Um, and it raises and it helps make sharks more valuable alive than dead. It provides economic incentives for fishermen to to do something else. Um, one of my conservation heroes is named Carl Safina. He's uh, also a, a brilliant author. If you've ever got get the chance to read one of his books, "Song for the Blue Ocean" is, is more scientific poetry of his. Uh, and he, I saw him give a talk where he said the future of ocean conservation is not save the sea turtles, it's provide the rural Mexican village with economic alternatives so they don't have to poach sea turtles. And that doesn't fit on a bumper sticker quite as well. Uh, so wildlife tourism, I think, has a place, but it's often unregulated and it gets out of control and it's not safe for sharks and it's not safe for people. Um, there's these people that ride the sharks and kiss the sharks and all that nonsense. Um, and there's also plenty of places where they disrupt shark behavior. And Oslob in particular that you mentioned, my brother and my sister-in-law went there on their honeymoon. Uh, I have not done that dive, but he texted me immediately after uh, and said, I just need to talk to you about this, this trip I just did. This was one of the coolest things I've ever done, and I felt so bad right after. Because the, the animals, like, is it better for whale sharks to have their behavior slightly disrupted than to be killed? Yes. But those are not our only two options. <laughs> Uh, so I support responsible, regulated wildlife tourism, which at the moment, Oslob is not. Um, and there are a lot of places that are. Another important thing with the, this idea that shark, making sharks more valuable alive than dead is a phrase that you hear in ocean conservation world a lot. Uh, more valuable to who matters. In the Bahamas, which is a global epicenter of wildlife tourism uh, with sharks, the a lot of the scuba operation are owned by Americans. In some cases, it's liveaboard. So you fly to Florida, you get on a boat, the boat goes to the Bahamas, you might never set foot in the Bahamas. And the person getting rich off this is not the fisherman who no longer has access to the fishing resource. So it matters. Uh, it, another issue with this is which species do you swim with? Uh, for the most part, the most critically endangered shark species are not gonna benefit from this because when something's super rare, and, I, and if I were to fly halfway around the world to swim with it and I didn't see it because it was super rare, I'd be angry. Uh, so it's, it's something of a, a limited local scale solution. It can be done quite responsibly. It's super fun if you get a chance to do it responsibly, but it's, uh, it is not the panacea that it's sometimes portrayed as. And there's some bad actors for sure. Thank you. You mentioned earlier about sharks being the cleanup crew and the apex predators of ecosystems. And I was wondering what would happen if there was a severe or complete extinction of the apex predator within an ecosystem, which and how that would affect down the ecosystem. Um, as you mentioned, that downward facing arrows are very important in them. Yes. I believe the terminology for that is top-down trophic cascade, but. Yes, so trophic cascades 
Uh, actually, just, we just covered this in my marine biology class at Arizona State that I teach this week. Uh, so I'm getting lots of student responses mailed to me while I'm traveling about what trophic cascades are and aren't for their homework. A, so a trophic cascade is slightly more complicated than that, but that's the start of it. It's that food web that we saw earlier. Remember that crazy diagram? If you remove the top level, what happens? The level right below it explodes in population. If you're no longer, uh, if you're no longer have predators keeping your populations under control, your, your numbers grow. And then what happens to what you eat? That shrinks. And then what happens to what that eats? That grows. So even though the sharks aren't interacting with what's down here, the loss of sharks impacts what's down here through these complicated trophic interactions, food web interactions. And it's anyone who tells you they can predict exactly what's gonna happen with a collapse of an ecosystem is someone you don't need to be trusting for things, but it's going to be unpredictable and it's, like it's going to be fairly epic in scope and it's going to be almost certainly very bad. But good question. There, there was an example of, um, the famous example of Trophy's Cascade is given to the Yellowstone Park, yes. the reintroduction of wolves. Yes. For those who are not familiar with that case study, is the idea that um, reintroducing wolves to the Yellowstone Park changed the shape of the river, inevitably due to the consequences it had on other species. Mm -hmm. Has there been an example where sharks have been reintroduced to an ecosystem and we've seen the ecosystem physically change, as in the geography of it? Yeah, so there aren't a lot of cases of shark reintroductions in general. Uh, but there is a, uh, to give you a, a, an ocean example of a trophic cascade that's very similar to the Yellowstone one. It's off the west coast of the United States, we have these beautiful kelp forests. It's these seaweeds that can be 10, 20, 30 meters high. It makes this complex three-dimensional forest underwater. All sorts of crazy fish and animals live in it. Sea urchins crawl along the bottom and they munch on kelp from the base. And sea otters eat sea urchins. So you've seen them lying on their back with, this, with the rocks you know, eating the sea urchins. The reintroduction of orca whales to that region led to orca whales hunting all the sea otters. And that led to the sea urchin populations exploding. And that led to sea urchins eating all the kelp forest and the whole kelp forest disappeared. So the orca whales don't interact directly with the kelp forest, neither do the sea otters, other than they wrap their little feeties around it so they don't drift away from each other. But they don't directly interact with it. But, the, but these new interactions cause ripple effects throughout the entire food web, and hundreds of animals that need the kelp forest to survive aren't there anymore. Uh, so in, now we're starting to see um, great white sharks come back off California, and otters come back off California. They're both protected species. They both have US federal government recovery plans. And they're eating each other. And we do not have a plan for that. Because when these environmental laws were made, we we're talking about populations that are at 1% of their historic highs. It's beyond our wildest dreams to have a problem like this, that their populations are increasing enough that they're interacting with each other. So there's a lot of very heated discussions about this in Washington, D.C. at the moment about what to do about this. Is, yeah. this, is this the orcas eating the, the in this In this sharks. case, it's the great white sharks eating the otters. Okay. Yeah, great white sharks are recovering, and that is stopping the otters from recovering. Oh, uh, thank you for the talk today. I just wanted to ask, what led to the decline in shark fin consumption, and can the same strategy be extrapolated to shark meat consumption? Yes, yeah, so the decline in shark fin consumption, a lot of it has to do with successful conservation messaging. Uh, especially, there's, there's not a lot of appetite for it among the millennial and Gen Z of uh, folks in China, uh, that they, they're exposed to Western culture and messaging and, and uh, some, uh, some of their homegrown environmental activism has led to less demand, less desire. Uh, one of the biggest things that resulted in a decline was Pres uh, President Hu Jintao of, of China a, few, a couple presidents ago. He was just in the news for something the other day. Uh, he was big on stopping corruption in the government. So it was not, his goal of saying we're not serving shark fin soup at government functions anymore had nothing to do with conservation. It's we're not gonna do these expensive luxury items while peasants are starving in the fields. And that led to a 30% reduction overnight. So it's things like that. Could that be applied to other things? Maybe, but I don't know. It, so far we're not seeing these other issues get anywhere near the same attention that the shark fin soup a crisis got in the 1990s and still gets today, even though it's largely resolved. Thank you, great question. 
whilst we're waiting for that question to happen, um, yeah. media, because you, you, you specialise as a writer. Yes. So obviously, we, the big example is Jaws. There's Deep Blue, and there's these other ones with Jason Stanford, what came out last year, I think. Yeah. But then there's also the positive, because um, I, I remember Shark's Tale, if anyone remembers Shark's Tale. Yes, Will Smith. another, the um, bad guys yeah, just came out exactly. with a movie. Um, yeah. So how, how important is the Bollywood, um, sorry, the Bollywood, the Hollywood industry in mm -hmm. terms of the, the movies they release about sharks? Because it says seen that every, every five years or so you get a oh, poster yeah. about sharks. So I just got, uh, on the Los Angeles stop of my book tour a few weeks ago, I just got interviewed for a documentary about this that's going to be called Shark Exploitation, about these bad shark movies. So that we have this Jaws effect that how, how a movie changed the world and how you perceive this issue. There is no Sharknado effect. There is no mega shark versus giant octopus effect. There is no <laughs> shark -topus effect. These are all real movies. Uh, because they're, they're so silly and bad that no one takes them remotely seriously. There's one about sharks falling from the sky. Yes, Sharknado. Sharknado. There, are six, <laughs> there are six Sharknado movies. <laughs> You gave us um, two examples of what not to do to help shark uh, conservation, but can you give us a couple of examples of things that everyday people can do to help yes. shark conservation? Yes, that's a great question. And when I, my, my typical answer for this is more geared to folks in the US because we have a more uh, participatory natural resource management system. Uh, but often I have to say things like, oh, what is it? It's, oct it's late October. In March, I would love it if you would send a letter to this meeting that'll be read. And people are like, but what can I do now? So the, the number one thing that most people can do to help save the ocean, including but not limited to sharks, is do not support unsustainable seafood practices. Notice that I am not saying don't eat seafood. There, that messaging has gotten stronger and louder from some corners of the eco wackadoodle left. Uh, in some cases, there's absolutely sustainable seafood science base that does exist. If you want to give up seafood, if you want to become vegan, certainly that's a valid choice. And certainly the, the dining options have become more palatable for that in the last decade or so. But if, you, if you're like me, you love seafood, you find it delicious, you find it healthy, you find it culturally important, there are ways of supporting sustainable seafood. Uh, and that's a big thing you can do. Other things you can do are help environmental nonprofits raise money, donate time. Uh, if you're a social media person, follow experts on social media and share what they have to say and don't follow extremist crazy people and don't share what they have to say. Uh, anything you can do to reduce your carbon footprint helps the ocean well, as long as everyone understands that the carbon footprint was literally invented by BP so that, they, so that we're talking about our carbon footprint and not theirs. Uh, it's still a useful thing to think about. Uh, use, using less single-use plastic, things like that is all helpful. Thank you. Mine was nearly the same question as she just asked, but it was, in, for example, because we, we do scuba diving and stuff, so uh -huh. I've done before some sort of work for a fisheries department, uh, but I was wondering if there's any other things like as a citizen, you know, in the water that we can do as well? Yeah, that beach cleanups, organized beach cleanups are great. Uh, that's the Ocean Conservancy coordinates those, or Sea Keeper uh, or River Keeper organizations coordinate those, and it's just like one day a year, a bunch of people come and they just get a stretch of beach and just clean up all the trash. Amazing if you can do that. Uh, that stuff can be great. There's uh, uh, if you're a more advanced scuba diver, Paddy is getting involved with uh, reef cleanups, but you need to have really excellent buoyancy control so you're not destroying the reef while you're picking trash off it. Uh, uh, Project Aware uh, is a PADI organization that focuses on that stuff, and that's, they're good to check out if you want to get more, do more scuba-focused. I was wondering, um, you mentioned three different uh, ways that sharks have offspring. I was wondering what kind of selection pressures led to those three methods kind of arising in different species of shark? Man, that's a great question. I have no idea. And it's not, <laughs> it's not get, we're going to get very mathy very quickly here, but it's not phylogenetically conserved, like at all. All of these are found in different families. And any given, so it's not that the, the sharks that evolved over here do this, and the sharks that evolved over here do this. It's a bunch of stuff happening all over the place. So it's, a, it's evolving over and over again, and that's super weird. Um, yeah, you mentioned um, sustainable exploitation. 
And I was just wondering how that might work, given that there are so many different species of sharks, not yes. all of which are exploited, but many of them are, because you would need to know an awful lot about population densities, about reproductive cycles, in order to be able to come up with yep. a sustainable quota. That was the first question. The second one was, um, if I saw shark meat for sale somewhere, how would I know that it had been sustainably harvested? And then the last thing would have been, what is a chimera? Could you give any example of what a chimera or chimera? You mentioned oh, yes, types yes. of sharks. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. I'll start with that last one because that's the quickest. So sharks, skates, rays, and chimeras are the cartilaginous fishes. You're probably familiar with stingrays. Skates look kind of like stingrays. Chimeras are sometimes called ghost sharks or ratfish. They look like a small sort of prehistoric face small shark. Uh, they're super cool. They're often found in the deep sea. Uh, so sustainable, sustainable fisheries, this gets complicated in legalese and mathy very quickly, but generally what we're talking about is we know how many fish are there, we know how long they live, we know how many babies they have, and from that you can calculate how many fishermen can remove from the population every year. And that's harder to do with sharks than it is to do with other fishers because sharks don't spawn. They have, uh, so they have fewer babies relatively late in life, relatively infrequently. Uh, but it still works basically the same way, just generally with lower quotas. And it does get, and there are some species that absolutely cannot withstand it and some that can. And generally, if you don't know, then people tend to err on the side of caution. How can you tell if something is sustainable in your area? Uh, if you're just at the seafood counter, uh, if it just says like shark, or if it just says snapper, or if it just says tuna, that's a bad sign. But if it says it was caught with this gear in this part of the world, you can look it up in a variety of guides. Uh, the Marine Conservation Society of the UK's Good Fish Guide has some details for stuff that's available uh, in and around London. Uh, where I'm from, the Monterey Bay Aquarium has something called Seafood Watch, which are little cards you can put in your wallet that list everything. Uh, the Marine Stewardship Council, blue checkmark fish, uh, there's only a couple sharks that are listed on there, but if you see that, that's an indicator that it's passed through some regress checks. And if it doesn't have any of that, if it just says tuna, if it just says shark, uh, again, if uh, marketers know that, or markets know that doing something the right way, more environmentally friendly way, costs more, and they want to be able to charge you a premium. And if they're not doing that, it means it's probably not caught the right way. Thank you. Lovely. Can we please give a round of applause to our speaker this evening, David? Thanks, everybody.